share this information in the chat as well. All right, so let's get into it. For today's agenda, um, I'll be going over um, structured versus unstructured data, then some text pre-processing, which is our first step in the entire workflow for um, natural language processing and working with text data. Then we'll go over some text vectorization techniques and then close out with some applications. Um, and then uh, that'll be for the first hour, then we'll take a five to 10 minute break and then we'll jump into the implementation with a Colab notebook. So first let's under, let's, let, us, let us understand why categorical and text data are different. Structured data or quantitative data is the type of data that fits very nicely into any sort of relational database or structured um, format. It's highly organized and easily analyzed. So when you think of structured data, think of things that would sit nicely in a spreadsheet. Um, this can be, you know, dates, phone numbers, zip codes, names of customers, etc. Um, this inherent structure and orderly, um, orderliness makes it very simple to query and analyze. Um, on the other hand, we have unstructured data, which is essentially everything else. This is comprised of data that is usually not as easily searchable. Examples of, of this include images, audio, video, text from social media postings. Um, so it does not fit very nicely into that spreadsheet or database. Um, it can be textual or non-textual data, and it can be human generated or machine generated. Um, so audio and video sort of fits into media. And then for text files, we have Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, emails. Um, as for emails, there is some internal metadata structure. So sometimes this can be called semi-structured, um, but the entire message field is unstructured and it can be very difficult to analyze with traditional tools. As for social media, we have data from, you know, se several social networking sites like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, and then as for mobile data, we have text messages and locations. And then for general communications, we can have chats or call recordings. And all of these examples are largely human generated, but machine generated data can also be unstructured. And this includes satellite images, scientific data, surveillance images and video or weather sensor data. And unstructured data is actually very important. And the volume of unstructured data is actually growing and that growth is accelerating and there is a very high value in unstructured data. So when unstructured data is accessible, searchable, available and relevant, it is then converted into information that a big company or a big enterprise can actually use to make better decisions and improve their product. So many organizations can essentially exploit this power of unstructured data. And this is where AI and machine learning technologies come in. And they are arriving in just in time to help companies automatically add structure to their data. Um, and uh, in, in one example of this is with natural language processing, where you're able to extract key data points and ultimately assign meaning to all sorts of uh, um, you know, data uh, examples such as business documents, emails, journal articles, and social media posts. And so now looking at machine learning, all machine learning models require the input data to be categorical or numerical. So imagine you're a data scientist at some blog company, and apart from data like the time spent or the frequency and other action related data points, there's a rich database of text data which can be analyzed. And so your first AI automation task could be to al algorithm, algorithm, algorithmically summarize blogs and suggest tags or those sorts of hashtags that we see on Twitter posts and um, on Instagram. So is it possible to make your machine learning model understand text data? So from there, we're going to jump into this general um, sort of workflow that we see when working with text data. So we start out with text pre-processing and we'll actually be going through each of these individual steps. From there, we have BDA or exploratory data analysis, um, which includes word to vec embeddings. Then we go into representation. So this includes tokenization and text to sequence. Then we have modeling where we're able to use actually these very big popular models. Some of them include the by LSTM. And lastly, actually deploying the model where we make our predictions and evaluate the model. So typically any NLP-based problem can be solved by this methodical workflow that has a sequence of steps. So we usually start out with a corpus of text documents and follow standard processes of text wrangling and pre-processing. Then we go into parsing and the basic EDA. And so based on these initial insights, we, actually, we usually represent the text using relevant feature engineering techniques. 
And depending on the problem at hand, we either focus on building predictive supervised models or unsupervised models, which usually focus more on pattern mining and grouping. And finally, we evaluate the model and the overall success criteria with relevant stakeholders or customers for that model, and we're able to deploy this final model for future usage. So looking specifically at text pre-processing, this can enable us to feed a machine learning model some text data and learn from it. And text pre-processing refers to this theory and practice of automating the creation or manipulation of, of electronic text. So transforming text into something an algorithm can actually digest, this entire process is quite complicated as we're converting text data, which is highly unstructured, into data that a machine learning, machine learning model can actually assume. Um, consume, sorry. Um, and so there's many different strategies uh, when we go uh, through this whole process of feature engineering. Um, some involve assigning each unique word-like term to a feature and then counting the number of occurrences per training example. However, if we were to perform the strategy right now, we'd end up with an absurd number of features depending on how big the data set is. And so as a result, every NLP problem requires a tailored approach to determine which terms are relevant and meaningful. And then this is where we actually are able to begin our text uh, pre-processing. So the first three steps of pre-processing, as I have listed here, are noise cleaning, stop words identification, and contraction mapping. So noise cleaning, uh, one of the key steps is uh, to remove, this is one of the key steps where we remove the noise so that the machine can more easily detect the patterns in the data. So text data contains a lot of noise and this can take the form of special characters such as hashtags, punctuation, numbers, and all of these are difficult for computers to understand if they are present in the data. So therefore we need to process the data to remove these elements. Additionally, it is also important to imply some attention to the casing of the words. So if we include both uppercase and lowercase versions of the same words, then the computer will see these as different entities, even though they may be the same. Next, we have stop words identification. So stop words are commonly occurring words that for some computational processes provide very little information or in some cases introduce unnecessary noise and therefore need to be removed. So this is particularly the case for text classification tasks. There are other instances where the removal of stop words is either not advised or needs to be more carefully considered. This includes any situation where the meaning of a piece of text may be lost by the removal of a stop word. For example, if we were building a chatbot and remove the word not from this phrase, I am not happy, then the reverse meaning may in fact be interpreted by the algorithm. So this would be particularly important for use cases such as chatbots or sentiment analysis. And this is where we're able to leverage the NLTK Python library, which is a natural language toolkit. And this has uh, several built-in methods for removing stop words. Lastly, we have contraction mapping. So contractions are shortened versions of words or syllables. Um, and so they often exist in either written or spoken forms in the English language. Um, these shortened versions or contractions of words are created by removing specific letters and sounds. In case of English contractions, they are often created by removing one of the vowels from the word. So examples would be to convert from do, uh, don't to do not and um, I apostrophe D to I would. And converting each contraction to, expand, to its expanded original form actually helps with text standardization. And from here, we get to our last two steps of text pre-processing, which is spell checking and stemming or lemmatization. So spell checking is obviously very important and there's a number of ways to achieve this. Um, for our example later on in the second half when we're coding, we're going to be using Microsoft's text blob, uh, which is a very simple package to install and import. And this is a very nice and easy to use spelling correction mechanism. As for stemming and lemmatization, um, so, excuse me, uh, stemming is a process of reducing words to their root form. For example, the words rain, raining, and rained have very similar and in many cases the same meaning. So the process of stemming will actually reduce these root, uh, the, all these words to the root form of rain. So rain, raining, and rained all get uh, sort of reduced to just rain. And this is again a way to reduce noise as well as the dimension, dimensionality of the data. So the NLTKA library also has methods to perform this task of stemming. 
Next, we have lemmatization. And the goal is the same as for stemming in that it aims to reduce wars to their root form. However, stemming is known to be a fairly crude method of doing this. On the other hand, lemmatization is a tool that performs full morphological analysis to more accurately find the root or the lemma for a word. And again, NLTK can be used to perform this task. So that covers everything for text preprocessing. Um, next, we're going to go into text vectorization. So te text vectors is the process of converting unstructured data to a numer numerical or vector representation. And I'll be going over three popular algorithms. First, I'll go over bag of words and then TF-IDF. Um, both of these I'll go into sort of the mathematical background for each of them, more specifically for TF-IDF, as well as going through a very nice and simple example. And then we'll uh, close out with word to back. So for a bag of words, um, so why a bag? Um, it is called a bag of words because any information about the order or structure of words in the document is completely discarded. So the model is only concerned with whether known words occur in the document, not where in the document. And so a very common feature extraction procedure for sentences and documents is the bag of words model, or BOW. In this approach, we look at the histogram of the words within the text. Therefore, we're considering each word count as a feature. So the general intuition is that documents are similar if they have similar content. Further, uh, that from the content alone, we can actually learn something about the meaning of the document. So the bag of words can be as simple or, or, or as complex as you would like. The complexity comes both in deciding how to design the vocabulary of the known words or tokens in our case, and how to score the presence of these known words. So this is perhaps the most simple vector space representation model um, for unstructured text. Um, so this is the general approach of transforming tokens into a set of features. Um, a vector space model is simply a mathematical model to represent unstructured data or any other sort of data as numeric vectors, such that each dimension of the vector is a specific feature or attribute. And so the model's name is such because each document is uh, re represented literally as a bag of its own words. So we're discard, uh, you know, completely disregarding the order of the words and sequences and the grammar as well. And so a bag of words is one of the most fundamental methods to transform tokens into a set of features, as I mentioned, and is used in document classification, where each word is used as a feature for training the classifier. For example, if we had a task of review-based sentiment analysis, the presence of words like fabulous and excellent indicate a very positive review, whereas if we had words like poor or annoying, this would point towards a negative review. And so the bag of words model represents each text document as a numeric vector where each dimension is a specific word from the corpus and the value could be its frequency in the document, um, just the number of times that it occurs in the entire document, denoted by a one or a zero, or even sometimes weighted values. So there's three general steps uh, while creating this model. The first step is text preprocessing, which involves converting the entire text into lowercase characters. So therefore we're removing all the punctuations and unnecessary symbols. The second step is to create a vocabulary of all the unique words from the corpus. And then in the third step, we actually create a matrix of the features by assigning a separate column for each word and then each row corresponds to a specific review or a specific document. So this process is known as text vectorization. So essentially each entry in this matrix signifies the presence or absence of the word in the entire document. So we put a one if the word is present and then a zero if it's not present. Um, and I'm actually going to step through an example just so we can go through these three steps that I just went over. So for our, uh, for our example, we're gonna take these four lines from a very uh, popular document, uh, Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. So um, here's a snippet of the first few lines of text from this book. And for this example, we're going to treat each line as a separate document. And then so these four lines will be our entire corpus of documents. So in our entire corpus, we have four, four uh, in, in our entire corpus, we have four documents. And these four documents correspond to these four lines. 
So now what we do is we design a vocabulary. So we construct our list of all the words in the entire model's vocabulary, and only the unique words are actually selected. And note that we are ignoring case and punctuation. So in our list, we actually have a vocab of only 10 words. Originally, we had a corpus of 24 words. If you look at all these words, we just reduced it to a list of 10 here. Um, and then the next step is to actually create the document vectors. So the uh, here is where we actually score the words in each document. So the objective is to turn each document of free text into a vector that we can use as input or output for a machine learning model. Because we know the voc vocabulary has 10 words, we can use a fixed length document representation of 10 with one position in the vector for, uh, to score each word. And we used a, uh, a fixed length of 10 because that was the original list of 10 words that we had. So the simplest scoring method is basically to mark um, a one for the presence of the word and a zero for the absence of that specific word. And using the arbitrary order, ordering of words listed above in our vocabulary, we can step through the first document, which is, it was the best of times, um, and then convert it into a binary vector. So the scoring of the document would look as follows. So this is, it was the best of times. And basically we can see that there's a one scored for each of these words, but then worst age, wisdom, and foolishness do not exist in that first line. So we then put a zero for each of those four, one, four words. And so we're able to sort of have this, this representation as a binary vector uh, we repeat the same process for the other three lines or our other three documents and so all ordering of the words is nominally discarded and we have a consistent way of extracting features from any document in our corpus and it's completely ready for use in modeling so new documents that overlap with the vocabulary of known words but they may contain words outside of vocabulary and but this can still be encoded so where only the occurrence of known words are scored and unknown words are completely ignored. And so you can see how this might naturally scale to very large vocabularies and very large documents. Um, and so uh, another important point is how we manage our vocabulary. So as the vocabulary size increases, so does the vector representation of documents. Um, in the previous example, the length of the document vector is uh, completely equal to the number of known words. So we had this fixed length representation of 10. But you can imagine that for a very large corpus, such as thousands and thousands of books, that the length of the vector might be thousands or millions of positions. Further, each document may contain very few of the known words actually in the vocabulary. So this results in a vector with lots of zero scores, and this is actually called um, sparse vector or sparse representation. So sparse vectors require more memory and computational resources when modeling and the vast number of positions or dimensions can actually make the modeling process very challenging for just traditional algorithms. As such, there is pressure to decrease the size of vocabulary when using a bag of words model. And so we can use some simple text cleaning techniques, um, which can be used as a first step. Um, and this is where we can um, ignore the casing of the words, we can ignore the punctuation, we can ignore stop words, we can fix misspell words, we can have stemming. And so all of these are the different steps that I walk through for the text preprocessing, and this definitely helps in managing our vocabulary that, then, that can scale at um, you know, a scale of a thousand or a million. So that's it for bag of words, and now I will switch over to TF-IDF. So TF-IDF um, is a combination of two metrics, which is term frequency and inverse document frequency. So it stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency. Um, and this technique was developed for ranking results for queries and search engines. And now it's a highly indispensable model in the entire world of information retrieval, as well as NLP in general. And so the TF-IDF model uses a scaling or normalizing factor in its computation. It also has several um, applications, specifically in information retrieval. Um, TF-IDF was invented for document searching and can be used to deliver, deliver results that are, more, that are most relevant to what you're searching for. So imagine you have a search engine and somebody looks for Kobe Bryant. The results will be displayed in order of relevance. That's to say that the most relevant sports articles will be ranked higher because TF-IDF gives the word Kobe Bryant a higher score. 
it's likely that every search engine you have they have, have ever encountered actually uses TF-IDF scores in its algorithm. And this is all happening in the background. Um, another very common application is keyword extraction. So TF-IDF is also useful for extracting keywords from text. And how is this done? So the highest scoring words of a document are the most relevant to that document. And therefore, they can be considered keywords for that entire document. Um, so if we're given a data set of n text documents, TF and IDF are defined as, as follows. So TF is term frequency, so the count of a term T in a document D. And then we have IDF, which is the inverse document frequency, which is the logarithm of the ratio of the total documents D in the entire corpus and the number of documents D containing the term T. And so together, we're able to get this relative importance of a term in the entire corpus. Um, so this TF-IDF value increases proportionally to the number of times a word appears in the document and decreases with the number of documents in the corpus that actually contain the word. And why do we use it and why does it work? Um, so machine learning with natural language is faced with one major hurdle and it's that um, its algorithms usually deal with numbers and natural language is text. So we actually need to transform that text into numbers which is the process that I mentioned of text factorization. And this is a very fundamental step in the process of machine learning for analyzing text. And different vectorization algorithms will drastically affect your end results. Therefore, you need to choose one that will deliver, deliver the results that you're hoping for. So once you've transformed the words into numbers in a way that's machine learning algorithms, in a way that, that machine learning algorithms can actually understand. Um, and the TF-IDF score can be fed to algorithms such as naive Bayes or support vector machines. And this helps to greatly improve the results of some more basic methods like just simple word counts. Um, so that explains, you know, why do we use it? And so why does it work? Um, so simply put, a word vector represents a document as a list of numbers with one for each possible word of the corpus. Vectorizing a document is taking the text and creating one of these vectors, and the number of the vectors somehow represents the entire content of the text. So TF-IDF enables us to give us, enables to give us a way to associate every word in a document with a number that represents how relevant each word is in that particular document. Then documents with similar relevant words, words will actually have similar vectors, which is what we are looking for in a machine learning algorithm. So here's a formula and this um, sort of mathematically represents the definition that I gave in this slide here of TF and IDF separately. Um, so as I mentioned, um, if we're looking at a term X within document Y, um, we have our TF or term frequency, which is the frequency of the term X in our document Y. And then the IDF value is this entire thing here. So we have a logarithm of a ratio. So on the top, we have the total number of documents. And on the bottom, we have the DFX, which is our number of documents containing the term X. And here's just another representation of the formula, um, just to sort of see it in a slightly different way. So here again, um, I have pointed out equation one, two, and three, because um, after this, I'm going to go into an example, just like I did with bag of words, where I'll be referring back to each of these equations. So equation one refers to how to calculate TF. Equation two is how to calculate IDF. And then equation three is essentially putting those two together, which is the entire TF IDF score of this term in a specific document. And so just to look at some properties of TF-IDF, so we compute this for every word in every document. And all of these documents um, is our entire corpus. And so the result that we get is this matrix with, with a shape of the number of words times the number of documents. So these are just our, the list of words. And here is document one all the way to document five. And so we have a single value for one word where, and then we end up with a matrix of values when considering all of our documents. So TF-IDF is a single value or score for one word, but a bunch of values forming a matrix when we actually consider all of the documents. So next, as I mentioned, we're gonna go through a very simple example to see how TF-IDF can be used in indexing and query document ranking. So say we have three documents. Document one is as follows. 
then we have document two, and then we have document three. So our first step is to compute this Fij, which is the frequency of term i in document j. Um, and this was uh, what I was referring to in equation one right here. So this is just very pure counting. And what we do is just we count up um, for each term i in documents one to three. So as you can see, I've calculated Fi1, Fi2, and Fi3. And then each of our terms is machine learning to use how to learn. And as you can see, we have basically counted up the number of times each of these occurs in these three documents. Next, we are going to compute the normalized term frequency. And this is again, referring back to our equation one. So each word in a single document should then divide the total number of words in that document. So as you can see, we have TFI1, TFI2, and TFI3. And again, we have the same words here, but basically we have just um, divided it by the total number of words in that particular document. And then next we will compute the IDF of each term. Um, and that's for each term I, and this is referring back to equation two that was listed right here. So um, in this step, what we have here is um, all of the terms, so machine learning teaches how to learn, and then, you know, the, uh, the entire, um, basically all the terms in the document one, two, three, all the unique terms, and then we have calculated our IDF value. And so notice that TF has actually two dimensions for word I and document J, but IDF only has one dimension, and that's just for the word I. We're not actually looking um, at any document-specific values. And then next for step four, we're going to compute the TF IDF for each word I in document J, and that's going, referring back to equation three, which is right here. So we're basically putting these two values together and computing the entire TF-IDF score. Um, so as you can see, we have TF-IDF I1, I2, I3, and then we basically have the same uh, words listed. And now we're basically putting um, our step one to step three all together to get our final step here. Um, so this can be then stored as a TF-IDF um, index. So basically for each document, we store the TF-IDF value of each term. And typically in practice, each document also needs to sort of go through tokenization, um, filtering out the stop words, stemming, lemmatization. So there's something that um, is, you know, a very general practice that is typically done. Um, and also as a side note, the TF-IDF implementation in um, scikit-learn actually generates um, a TF-IDF matrix with the shape of n terms times the uh, vocabulary size. So if a word in the voca vocabulary does not exist in the document, the corresponding element will be zero. So that's just like a general practice where if it does exist, um, if there's a presence of that word, it's one. If that word is absent, then it's zero. Um, and so that's where we typically run into that issue, again, of having a sparse matrix where if we have a very large vocabulary and we have a bunch of zero values, um, we get into a sparse matrix and that can um, lead to complications with um, requiring a lot of computational power. Um, and also as a, as a side note, um, uh, so if we were given a query, say machine learning and we had to compute uh, TFI yet. So um, this is looking at a very specific case since we're looking at only just these two values of machine and learning. But here we basically have taken the TF IDF value separately for them and then just multiplied those two values together. So here we are, are able to get our final final TF IDF value for the specific, uh, you know, the specific term in our entire vocabulary. So here we have machine and here we have learning. Um, and then here we have comp computed the same values, but now it's specific to the documents. So we have document one, two, and three. And that's just some further analysis that we can do. Um, so that concludes everything for bag of words and TFIDF. Um, I know that's like quite a bit of information to go through, um, but now we're going to be going through the last major section of our, of our content today, and that's focusing on word to vec so word to vec was introduced in 2013 by Google, and this is where word vectors are built on the idea that words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. So word to vec actually takes a very large corpus and then makes a data set of tuples, where each tuple contains a word X and then a word in the context of X. 
And then from there, you would use a neural network to then learn to predict the context word of X given this word X. And so this, um, this entire word to vec is basically built on the general assumption that words that occur in similar context tend to have some similar meanings. So going off of that, context matters. And here we have two um, examples of that. So we have semantic relatedness, where um, this is saying that there's some relation between words. For example, there's, a, there's this relation between truck and road, or bee and honey. And I'm sure you can think of um, some more examples on your own. And then we also have semantic similarity. And this is slightly different because we're actually looking at words that are used in the same way and in interchangeable context. So we could look at car versus auto or doctor and surgeon. So things like that. So that's just a good, a, a good distinction to keep in mind between semantic relatedness and semantic similarity. Um, and going back to the Wurtzbeck model, um, this is the, so the baseline pre-trained model actually has 300 dimensions and 3 million unique words. And this was built from the, from Google news data in the, um, in the training corpus. That's just a side note, um, just to show you exactly what, what is this large scale of the Wurtzbeck model. So a word to vec model is a feed forward shallow neural network model with a single hidden layer. And so the last session in our, in, in our entire seminar series, we'll be going over neural networks. And so hopefully we can um, sort of clear, clear that up, but that's just kind of a very uh, basic definition of this word to vec model. And um, each word is, rep is represented by a vector. Um, this is a very you know, common thing that I've referred to with text vectorization. So here we have an array of numbers based on the embedding size. And what Wurtzbeck does is that it finds the relation, whether that's semantic or syntactic, um, between the words which was not possible by the traditional TF-IDF or the frequency-based approach. And so what we're able to do is transform the unlabeled raw corpus into labeled data. And this is done by mapping the target word to its context word. And essentially, it's able to learn the representation of, a, of words in a classification task. And so, you know, I find the concept of the beddings to be one of the most fascinating ideas in machine learning. So if, if, if you ever use Siri or Google Assistant, Alexa, Google Translate, or even a smartphone keyboard, uh, keyboard um, you have next word prediction, then, uh, you know, chances are that you've def definitely benefited, benefited from this idea that has become very central to natural language processing models. And um, there's, quite, there's been quite a development over the last couple of decades in using embeddings for neural models. And so some very recent developments include contextualized word embeddings, um, which has led to cutting edge models like BERT and GPT-2. Um, I won't be going over those in today's presentation, but that's just something to keep in mind. Those are very nice state-of-the-art models that currently exist in the NLP world. Um, and so here's just a visual representation of the word to vec model that I described, where we have that feed forward um, shallow neural network model with this single hidden layer that you see right here. Um, and in each of these layers, we have a certain number of neurons. Um, in our input web vector, as you can see, we have a value one is in this ith position, and this corresponds to the ith word. Um, and then we end up with the total number of v positions. And then we have some weight matrix matrices. I won't be going into the details of this, but I just um, this just sort of helps to visualize and to, to understand a little bit better about what does this word to vec model uh, mean and what is it doing. And so, looking at the general process of the word to vec model, so when we train a model, each one hot encoded word gets a point in this dimensional space where it learns and groups the words with similar meaning. So we're able to create this embedding lookup layer. So if you see here, this is what I mean by the one hot vector. So if you look at this one value right here, that then corresponds to this embedding weight, weight matrix and this specific row in that matrix. And then after some matrix computations, we're able to get our hidden layer output. And so this general process is you will have tens of thousands of unique words in your text vocabulary. And computations with such one hot encoded vectors like the one here um, will be very inefficient because most values in your one-hot vector will be zero. As you can see here, out of the five values, only one is actually the value of one. And so the matrix calculation that will happen in between a one-hot vector and the first hidden layer will then result in an output that will have mostly zero values. 
And so what we do is we use embeddings to solve this problem, and this helps to greatly improve the efficiency of our network. And embeddings are just like a fully connected layer. And so what we typically call this layer is an embedding, embedding layer, and then the weights correspond to the embedding weights. And so then we end up with this entire embedding weight matrix. Um, so just to highlight some key points, um, as I mentioned, the embedding layer is just a hidden layer. Um, the lookup table is just the embedding weight matrix, as you can see here in this diagram. Um, and this lookup is just sort of a shortcut for matrix multiplication. Um, and then this lookup table is trained just like any other weight matrix. Um, and word to vect falls under prediction-based embeddings, which tends to predict a word in a given context. And typically these models are very shallow. Um, they're only a two-layer neural network, and these are trained to reconstruct linguistic context of words. So that's kind of a nice um, takeaway from word to vec is that context matters. Um, and so now I'll go through um, just a couple of different examples of, of word to vec And so um, here we see here in example one versus example two. Um, example one, but the vector of the words are quite similar. So we have cat and dog. Um, and then we have vector, uh, the second vector where the vector of the words are not similar. So cat and pencil. And so similarity is defined by the frequency of the two words in discussion. So if you look back, our first vector here is cat dog, and our second one is cat pencil. And so if you were to take this sentence, I like to pet my blank, and then my plank does not like the postman. And we look at, consider these three different words, dog, cat, and pencil. And then we basically see how many times are they used in the same context. So that helps to sort of find us um, the semantic relation between these two words. So obviously cat and dog have a much higher similarity value as compared to cat and pencil. Um, so this kind of helps, you know, this should convince you of the power that the context of a word has just on the word itself and not any other information about the word. And then we have another example here. Um, and so what word to vec allows us to do is some mathematical operations on vectors as well. So here we can look at, um, this is a very uh, commonly used example. So what you can see is if we were to take king and then subtract man, but then add woman, that equals queen. So we're able to sort of take away this gender attribute, but then replace it with the, uh, another gender attribute. Then we're able to generate a new word. Um, and this is all based upon um, some, you know, slightly complicated mathematical operations, but things like this help us to sort of uh, utilize the, uh, the strength of embeddings and improve um, all of our models. So if we were to perhaps look at the example of, you know, man is to woman as uncle is to question mark, you know, we can see that that would typically be um, aunt. And a way to sort of quantify that is to look at cosine distance. Um, and so that cosine distance is something that's typically calculated like this. So sort of the comparison between man to woman versus king to queen. As you can see, these distances are, you know, if not completely equal, at least almost equal. And that helps us to sort of better understand the semantic relatedness between these two different, um, uh, you know, uh, these two different sets of words. And then for our last example, um, this is a TSNE plot, which stands for T Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. And this is a very, uh, nice machine learning algorithm that's typically used for visualization. Um, and so this is a non-linear dimensionality reduction technique that is very well suited for embedding high dimensional data. Um, and so specifically, it models each high dimensional object by a two or three dimensional point in such a way that similar objects are modeled um, by nearby points and dissimilar objects are modeled by distance po distant points and this is done with this high probability and so TSNE has been used for visualization in a wide range of applications which includes computer, computer security research, music analysis, cancer research, bioinformatics, as well as biomedical signal processing and it's often used to visualize high-level representations that are learned by an artificial neural network. And just to go a little bit deeper into the architecture for word to vec So first we have uh, CBAO and we have SkipRAM. So CBAO here, we're able to predict the current word based on context. And so here the input will be the context neighboring words and the output will be the target word. Um, this is based on the window method where we're able to uh, assign a window size. So if a window size is set to one, for example, 
one word from both sides of the target are being considered. Um, so basically plus, plus one and minus one. Um, similarly, in each iteration, the window will basically slide by a single stride and then our neighbors, neighbors will keep changing. So you kind of can kind of think of um, if you have this large scale and you just have this one word, um, but then you have uh, a range of plus one, minus one, you can basically scale it anyway, up or down. And then in every single stride that you move, um, you're actually changing your neighbors every single time. And so you can just think of sort of this, this moving window is what we end up with. Um, and so this is just another uh, visualization of the C bow. So here we have our input, and then in the middle we have our projection. Um, and lastly, we end up with this, this output right here. Um, and so C bow, I, I didn't mention, it actually stands for continuous bag of words. So this is where you're able to predict the current word given the context words within that specific moving window. And so the input layer contains the context words and the output layer contains the current word. And the hidden layer that's in between contains a number of dimensions in which we want to represent the current word that, we're, that is present at the output layer. So that's what's happening here between the input layer, the middle layer, and then finally our output layer. Um, and so this uh, CBAO is, uh, is basically learning to predict the word by the context. And so here the input will be the context neighboring words and the output will then be the target word. And the limit on the number of words in each content in each context is determined by a parameter called the window size. So our, as I said, our input layer is basically this white box content, so quick brown. Um, and then our target layer is a blue box word, so the. And then our window size is five. So that's just um, sort of the window size that's been chosen here. Um, next, we have skipgram. And so skipgram predicts the surrounding context words within a specific window given the current word. Um, so the, the input layer contains the current word, the output layer contains the context words, and the hidden layer in between contains a number of dimensions in which we want to represent the current word that we're present at in the input layer. And so here, just like we had for the CBAO method, now we have this for skipgram. So it's similar to CBAO. Um, the only difference is that instead of predicting the current word based on the context, we actually try to maximize the classification of the word based on another word in the same sentence. Um, so basically, skipgram is learning to predict the context by the word itself. So here, the input will be this um, will be the uh, will be the word itself, and the output will be the target context. Um, and so the limit on the number of words in each context is again determined by this parameter that we have, which is the window size. And so the basic idea of word embedding is words that occur in similar contexts tend to be closer to each other in vector space. So that's kind of just the general intuition behind how we have this architecture set up for, for word to vec And so for our last um, section on our theoretical portion for today is popular applications. So first I'll jump into text mining. Um, so text mining is a process of implementing statistical and machine learning models to draw the insights and to accurately predict from the from the data. And so, so far we have learned how to prep the data and to turn text into numeric values. Um, and so that's kind of just what I uh, went over um, in earlier parts of the session. And so then what we'll be focusing on um, next is basically trying to learning some of the techniques um, to interpret and draw meanings from this prepped data. Um, so text mining is widely used in knowledge driven organizations. Um, and it's just this general process of examining large collections of documents to discover new information or to perhaps um, answer specific research questions. Um, text mining identifies facts, relationships, and assertions that would otherwise remain buried in the mass of textual, textual big data. And so once extracted, this information is converted into a structured form, um, as I mentioned, with uh, using text vectorization. And text mining um, employs a variety of metho methodologies to actually then process the text. And one of the most important of these is being um, natural language processing. And then next we have text analytics. And so this is the automated process of translating large volumes of unstructured text into quantitative data to then uncover insights, trends, and patterns. And so combined with data visualization tools, this technique actually enables companies um, and individuals to understand the story behind the numbers and to make better decisions. 
So text mining, text analysis, and text analytics are often used interchangeably with just this general end goal of analyzing unstructured text to obtain insights. However, uh, while text mining um, provides insights of a qualitative nature, text analytics aggregates all these results and turns them into something that can actually be quantified and visualized through charts and reports and, and other, other uh, manners as well. Um, so text analysis and text analytics often work together to provide a complete understanding of all kinds of texts, which includes emails, social media posts, surveys, customer support tickets, and uh, furthermore. Um, and lastly, we can look at some very popular models. So here are some that I'd like to point out. Um, we have our naive Bayes, um, an application of that is document classification. We have k-means, um, which we actually went through in a previous uh, session, which um, comes under the application of clustering. Um, we will have, um, in our last session for the seminar, we'll be going over neural networks, and a very common application for that is document classification. Uh, we've also gone over k nearest neighbors and word clustering and these applications are document classification and concept extraction uh, respectively um, and so now i'll just uh, go through a quick recap so as i mentioned we started out with looking at structured versus unstructured data and seeing just how popular unstructured data is becoming and how much value there is in this form of data then we went over all the five different steps of text pre-processing. So we start out with noise cleaning, then stop words identification and removal, um, contraction mapping, spell checking, and then stemming and lemmatization. Then we went over text vectorization. I went through three um, general subcategories of these. So we had the bag of words, our TFIDF, and lastly, word to vec. And lastly, we went through some um, applications, so just some popular applications, as well as calling out some um, very useful methods and exactly what um, what application each of these models had. Um, and so that wraps it up for our theoretical portion. Um, and so here is the link to the Google Colab project that we have for this week. Um, the link to this will also be shared in the chat. Um, so we're coming up close to halfway through today's session. So I'm actually going to take a 10 minute break. Um, I'm currently in the Pacific time zone. So I'm going to um, say 1 p.m. is when we'll start up. That's uh, 4 p.m. for Eastern time. And so I'll jump back on at that time and uh, we can get started on the, um, the implementation section for today's session. Thank you. Um, so hopefully everyone enjoyed that little break. Um, and uh, let me just make sure everything is set up here. Okay, so um, this is where we left off. And so if we look at, if we just click on this link and this was actually it was also shared in the chat. Um, so you can just copy that and open that link up and it will take you to this, um, right here, which is our notebook. And so before we get into it, I'm actually going to show how to open this notebook in Google Colab. So what you'll do is make sure you first have this. Um, let me just move this. Uh, okay, so um, what we want to do is basically just go over to Google and what you can do is just type in Colab and then click on Google Colab. So all you need is just a, a Google account in order to um, sort of open any notebook that you would like. And then here, we're gonna actually gonna navigate over to GitHub. And sometimes it'll ask for some um, authorization. And so here, what we're gonna do is enter our GitHub URL. So the exact URL that you want to um, type in is the github.com slash women who code data science. So just kept, copy this over here. Enter that URL and then press enter. Um, and then that will take us to the entire repository for women who code data science. And um, these are our previous notebooks from our previous sessions. We just wanna scroll down here and open our text classification notebook. And that should open up the notebook in your own system. Um, and hopefully everyone is able to do that. Um, please let me know if you're having any issues. Um, 
you can just put a uh, a thumbs up, um, just a, a B for, for thumbs up if everyone is able to get to this point. Um, okay, I see one. I'll just wait for a couple more just to get some confirmation. Just want to make sure that everyone is completely set up before I start uh, getting into it. Um, all right, perfect. I see a couple more. Okay, so um, now that we're here, so um, today our data set will be a fake news data set and you can actually just click on this link that's in the notebook and you can see some more um, uh, information on our data set. So this is actually um, something that's on Kaggle, which is a very popular website where you can access um, data sets, um, existing notebooks, all sorts of things. And so what um, this general fake news data set is being used for is to try to identify unreliable news articles. Um, and so if you navigate over to the data tab right here, this is where all the, the data exists. And this is what we want to download. So just scroll down here and what you can do is just click download all. And that will basically download the entire um, data set. And what we need is a train.csv, a test.csv, and a submit.csv. So make sure all three of those are downloaded. You can also click on them individually and just click this button right here if you would like to individually download them, but it's just easier to do it all in one zipped folder. So if you click on that, it'll unzip the folder. And typically what I like to do is actually save it um, in you know, desktop or documents, just a very nice and easy, easily accessible folder on your system so that when we go back to Colab, it'll be pretty easy to just come back here and, um, and access it. So let me actually, I was in this one here. So um, the steps that I just went over, they're also um, listed here in the notebook itself, but hopefully everyone is able to download those three files. And so once downloaded, what we want to do is actually upload them to our notebook. So uh, we have this little navigation bar here. Just click on the bottom one where it looks like a little folder. That's where all of our files will go. So what you can do is click this uh, file icon, which has an uh, uh, upward arrow in it. And then what you wanna do is go to where your fake news uh, folder has been downloaded to. Go to that specific location and then select all three of these. Um, you can just select one and just click shift. And that basically selects all of them. Click open. And this might take some time because I believe um, the train.csv is a pretty big file. So it just shows a progress bar. Just wait for those to fully upload um, before you can, um, before we can actually start using them. Um, and I think someone needs a link to the code. So let me just, um, it's currently in the chat, but let me just put that right there. It's also in the in the slides. Um, so if you go to the slides um, number slide number sixty four, it's also in there. Um, all right. So those are still being uploaded. Um, but what I'll do in the meantime is here are just a couple commands. So PWD, what it does is it helps to check which folder in the Google Colab notebook that we're currently in. So if we just do PWD, um, and just like in previous notebooks, uh, what you can do to run this code is basically press the play button, or you can play uh, press um, command enter if you're on a Mac or control enter if you're if you're on a Windows. So it does just do that. And that'll show that we're in content. So that content folder is basically this entire file um, system here. Um, and then if you go to LS that basically lists out every single um, you know, file that exists in this content folder. So as you can see, we have our sample data folder and then we have submit, train, and test. Um, so the train is still being um, uploaded, but in the meantime, we can, before we actually load it in, um, this big code block is basically loading in all of the necessary packages and different libraries that we need. So as I mentioned, NLTK, a very important natural language toolkit. Um, we'll be using this for several things, um, specifically for our text preprocessing. Um, in NLTK, we're downloading specific things. Um, this is just for some stop words. Um, then we have our tokenization. And we're also using some things from Scikit-Learn, specifically the count vectorizer, multinomial naive base, because that is our model that we're doing for our text classification. Then we have our TF-IDF transformer. 
Um, we also have a couple of different classifiers, the random forest, extra trees, ADA boost, and decision tree. So just run this one right here, and that shouldn't take too long. It's basically just going to make sure that you have all of these packages downloaded and ready to go so that we can start using them. Um, so this train CSV is still being loaded in, so I'll just give it, um, hopefully it'll be done in about a minute or so, and then we can start to load in our data. Um, so I'll just give that a little bit more time. Um, so here's where we're actually loading in our train CSV. So um, we are basically using the dot read CSV function from pandas. Um, and then we're basically printing out the number of rows and columns. And then we also want to remove our empty rows. And we do that by dropping any values that have a NA value in there. And then we basically will print out the number of rows and columns again, just to see if any were removed after we sort of remove these empty rows. Um, so I see a question about how to um, upload the files. So the way you do that, there's two ways. First, you can click this button right here. It's a file icon with um, an upward arrow. And doing that will basically open up this little pop-up window where you can go through and actually upload the files and um, you know, just remember where you um, downloaded that zip folder. Um, it, the default setting is typically in your download is where it'll show up, but I just chose to change it to my desktop so that it's a little bit easier to access. Um, you can also just do a right click here and press upload and the same thing pops up. Um, so hopefully that clears up that question. And so now the train.csv is finally uploaded. So let's run this cell right here. And as you can see, we have this many rows and this many columns. And luckily, no rows were empty. So we basically retained all of our original data. And now we'll do the same exact thing, but for our test um, CSV file. And here we have slightly fewer rows. Um, and that's because we typically do sort of an 80-20 split between train and test. So basically 80% of our original data set is in our training set and then 20% is in our test set. Um, and then the dot info function basically just um, helps to get some more information um, on this um, data set. So here we see kind of the different um, columns, the number of non-null values as well as the data type. And we do the same thing for the test set. Um, and here we're basically counting up the number of null values for each of our train and our test. Um, and so as you can see, um, we do have some null values. Um, specifically, it's pretty high for our author value here and for our author value for the, both the train and the test. So what we'll do now is basically um, help to take out some of the, the those uh, missing values. Um, so after we run that, now we can see that we have um, slightly uh, fewer uh, null values and the same thing for the test set. Um, and let's just run those. And so, yeah, um, and even though it's not very crucial, we do want to keep the data for both the title and the author and the training set. Um, so basically, we're going to do that by updating all of these NAW, um, NAN or, you know, just missing values as basically um, these two uh, quotes. So let's just do that. So basically, we're filling in all of those values with just this, um, this right here. So now, finally, we have no null values for both our train and our test. Um, so hopefully everyone is able to get to this point. Um, luckily, these code cells don't take a very long time to run. So it's pretty nice and easy to sort of just, um, you know, load in our data sets, get some basic information on them and make sure that any missing values are just sort of filled in um, so that we're not uh, really having any missing data. Okay, so now I'll jump into our pre-processing steps. So, um, what, as I mentioned in the theoretical portion, we kind of start out with, um, we have expanding contractions, which is the contraction mapping, we have noise cleaning, we have identification and removal of stop words. So for contraction mapping, we're actually going to be installing and importing this contractions uh, package. So if you just run that file, or sorry, run that code, um, you'll see that it's collecting a variety of different libraries here, and we're able to install these these packages and that's what we need to expand our contractions so uh, what we do here is um, something that actually happened with this um, data set it was it was quite um, um, interesting was that this specific string was appearing in 
um, in our data set and it was sort of this edge case and this is because it has some special characters and so because of that it actually made the entire contraction mapping fail um, so this step is basically helping to take out all of the rows that actually contain um, this specific word um, so that's something that's like pretty commonly done because um, you know, we can assume that just running some basic contraction mapping, it, it's not going to cause any sort of, um, you know, failures. But uh, what, what our team actually had to do was, because it was failing, we had to go through and see, you know, why is it failing? Is there a specific word or an edge case that we were able to narrow it down to the specific word? So what we're able to do is basically extract um, and remove every single row that contained this word. Um, and then we were able to successfully run our contraction mapping. And then we do the same thing for our test set as well. So here we basically, um, we have this many rows and this many columns after we, we remove this edge case word. Um, and then from here, what we end up doing is, is actually combining the column title, author, and text into one column for our training data. And this is basically done to have more content. So that what, that's what this code is doing here. Um, and then after that, what we end up doing is um, uh, here we're uh, calling a lambda function where basically for every uh, uh, each of these contractions, we're actually splitting the word. Um, and that's uh, done through this entire lambda function. Um, and this might take a little bit of time because it actually is actually going through every single row um, in the train set and every single row in the test set. And as you saw, they're, they're pretty big. Um, so this might take a little bit of time. Um, so let me just wait for that to run. Um, and I see a question about contraction mapping. So what I can do in the meantime is actually go back into our slides and I can sort of reiterate that a little bit. Um, let's see, where did it go? Okay, so contraction mapping. Um, so as you know, contractions are this um, basically like a shortened word. Um, of, a, of the original word. So if you have don't, it basically can be expanded to do not. Um, and so that's um, generally what you want to do because when you convert every contraction to this expanded form, then it actually helps to um, standardize the data just a little bit more. Um, and so standardization and normalization of your data set is really important. And that's what contraction mapping helps to do. So basically, it's called mapping because you basically map the original word don't to do not. And then you basically, um, in that mapping association, um, we're actually ex uh, expanding that contraction. So we expand don't to do not. Um, and you know that's just one example of a contraction. There's several contractions in the English language. Um, okay, so this code has finished running. And so now we can take a look at our train and our test set. Um, so as you can see, we have our ID, which is basically just the, the uh, row number. Um, we have our label as one or zero, and then we have our total. So this total, as I mentioned, uh, what we did in an earlier step, uh, where did it go? Yeah, so this is where we combined the column title, the author, and the text into this single column. And so as you can see, we basically pushed all of these values into a single column, um, and we basically renamed this um, this new column as total. And we do that for both the train and the test set. And as you can see, we basically retained the same number of, um, of rows for each of these uh, separate data sets. Um, and from there, what we're going to do is basically uh, join back this entire list of items into one string. So as you can see here right now, um, all of these values are basically separate values in this entire big um, list of separate items. But what we want to do is actually um, make sure that the model can actually recognize it as one single string. And so the way we do that is basically call the dot join function um, for both the train and the test set. Um, again, this might take a little bit of time. I guess that was, that was pretty quick. Okay, so the train and test set are both done. So now basically we've been able to go from this list of individual strings to just one very long string. Um, so that concludes for contractions, and now we're going to move to some noise cleaning. Um, so what we're going to be doing is looking at spacing, special characters, and lower casing. Um, so first, we're going to basically convert every single value in the string to a lowercase. Um, and then we're also going to be applying some regex. 
Um, and so if, as you can see here through these different values, here's some explanation for those. Um, so I'm just gonna run this as I'm explaining that. Um, so this right here, the carrot top, that basically helps to match everything, um, but everything inside the block quotes themselves. Um, then we have this backslash W that helps to match any word character. Um, so that's basically equal to lowercase a to z or uppercase a to z or zero to nine. Um, and then we have backslash D and this helps to match a digit anywhere equal from zero to nine. Um, and then we have backslash S which helps to match any of these white space characters which, are, which is equal to any of these values right here. Um, and then just the apostrophe on its own basically helps to match the character um, that, uh, you know, completely literally, and this is case sensitive. Um, and lastly, we have our plus sign, and this helps to match between one and unlimited times, as many times as possible, giving back as needed. Um, so that finished running, and now we're basically going to call the same exact um, sort of noise cleaning process on our test set. Um, and from there, we're going to go into um, some tokenization. Um, so for our tokenization, we're going to be calling our um, word tokenized function, which was something that um, NLTK allows us to um, very easily use. So we're going to call that tokenization on our tra train set and then our test set afterwards. Um, so this will definitely take some time. Um, so I'm going to let that run and then we'll call our test, um, our test as well. And um, I see a question here. Um, if we're running the same steps for training and tests, why not do the split after all these steps? Um, that's a very good question. Um, that definitely is one way to do it, but um, just general practice is to sort of have it already split up and then call the pre-processing separately. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, use any more resources or take any more time, um, but it does help to just keep things separate. Um, and in case the train test has some issue uh, that's specific only to the train, then it helps you to sort of just um, sort of localize the issue to that and helps you to sort of identify what is causing that issue. And the same goes for the test set. So it kind of just helps to keep those a little bit separate. Um, and that's just what I've chosen to do here as well. So that is still running. Um, that is gonna take some time, but um, so after we have finished our noise cleaning, the last thing to do is actually, um, okay, so that's done. All right. So as you can see here, we have our original um, sort of uh, all of our different row values, and then we have all of them, but now they're tokenized. So they're basically different individual tokens. And this is kind of referring back to our, um, uh, this um, helps sort of um, create this, this vector of words. Um, and that basically helps it helps the model to actually, you know, recognize these different word, uh, you know, these different text uh, word, uh, these different words in this entire text document as um, separate tokens. Um, and then our last step for pre-processing is our stop words. So we're going to first um, make sure to download the stop words library from NLTK, and we want to make sure to use the English um, language for our stop words. Um, I don't remember exactly how many different languages they offer, but it's nice that they kind of have different stop word libraries because um, there's people all over the world um, using these techniques. Um, so uh, this is just some basic visualization. I'm not going to go too much into depth on this because I kind of want to get to the actual model itself, but um, on your own time, if you want to look through these a little bit more, this basically just helps to visualize different things. So first we're looking at, um, before removing any, um, what, when we check the occurrence of stop words in the article content. So we didn't actually remove the stop words yet. That was just sort of just installing and importing everything. But here we can see kind of what, what does it look like before actually removing any stop words. Um, and then here's just another plot. And so this is looking at the train total column and the test total column. Um, and then here is just another visualization of, again, um, basically looking at the top non-stop words for both the train and the test. So I'll just run both of those and we can quickly go over them. So as you can see, um, said Mr. Trump would want new people. Um, 
kind of the same uh, top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as uh, sort of the, uh, the same top seven words for both the train and the test. Um, so now we can actually go ahead and actually remove um, these stop words. And the way we do that is basically saying if the word um, is not in the stop words library, then we want to keep it um, in, our, in our data. And then we basically go through um, every single value in this total tokenized column, remove any word that, um, or basically keep any word that is not in the stop words library, and then basically join it again, just like how we did in the past. So basically we join it back into this um, big long, um, you know, one single uh, value. And we do that for both train and test. Um, and so here we're just uh, doing a little bit more with um, parts of speech. So here we're, what we're going to do is actually evaluate the parts of speech tags for our train set data and our test set data. Um, so this, I believe, takes a little bit of time. Um, I might, uh, let's see. I was writing this earlier and it took a little bit of time, but hopefully it won't take too long. Um, but from there, what we're going to do is actually use another visualize visualizer for parts of speech, which is yellow brick. Um, you can actually refer to this link here for more information. Um, and sometimes this does require to sort of reload the workbook to actually activate it. And so you kind of have to rerun all of the cells again from the beginning. Um, so I might choose to not do that just in the interest of time. Um, but let me just see how long this takes um, since we do have a little, uh, little bit of time still left before we jump into the model. Um, but what I'm referring to by uh, parts of speech tags is these various tags that we have. So we have ADJ for adjective, we have ADP for ad position, we have ADV for adverb and et cetera. And these are just some examples of each of those in English. So we have new, good, high for adjective, for adverb is really already still. Um, you know, now we have year, home, cost. So basically it goes through each of these individual um, rows in our train and test set and basically tags each of them with what part of speech they are. Um, and that helps to just give some more information about our data set. And there's a uh, you know, variety of things you can do with that information. Um, so I believe this is still running. Um, I think I'm just going to stop this for now, um, just because it's taking a little bit of time. And I will now uh, just scroll back down. Um, if you would like to sort of carry on with this um, set of code cells on your own, feel free to. Um, I just don't want to do that right now because it's uh, taking a bit of time. Um, so now we're actually going to jump into the exciting part, which is our text classification. Um, so for uh, jumping into our methodology for text classification, what you were going to first do is check if our number of examples for fake versus not fake labels is equal or not. Um, and so what we're going to do is basically look um, at the train label and we see that, you know, it's fairly balanced between um, fake being um, the one value, so 10,368 versus non-fake or zero, which is 10,387. Um, and so this is just visualizing what we just saw. And as you can see, there's a very nice balance between our two different target features of fake and not fake. Um, and from there, what we're going to do is extract the label column from our train um, data set to be the target Y variable. Um, so basically we're assigning it to this new set um, called targets. And from there, we're going to actually drop the label column from our train data set. So now it should look like this. Um, and then, uh, so we're going to first start out with doing some TF, IDF, and the um, count factorizer. Um, so this is kind of already the theoretical part that I went over um, just, you know, uh, in the first part of today's section. So I'm not going to um, go over that again, but just as a reminder, this is our formula for calculating TF, IDF. Um, so we start out with the TF XY, which is a frequency of term X in document Y. And then we multiply that by our IDF value, which is a logarithm of this ratio. We basically divide the total number of documents by the number of documents containing the term X. Um, and so earlier we had um, uh, basically imported this TF IDF transformer and count factorizer. So we're basically going to just call those. Um, 
And here is basically a simple example showing, you know, what kind of engrams does the range from one to two create? Um, I'm, this is something just to sort of explain exactly what is this count factorizer doing. Um, uh, feel free to just sort of run this on your own and just uh, this just sort of helps to understand exactly what is happening. We're just taking a very simple example of the sentence and apple a day keeps the doctor away. And then seeing what actually happens when you do sort of run this count vectorizer on it. Um, but what we're going to do now is actually count, uh, call the count vectorizer and the, um, you know, the TF-IDF uh, transformer on our data. And so we're going to basically first fit the train data to the count vectorizer and then fit the n grams count to the TF-IDF transformer. Um, again, this will take some time. Um, because it basically has to go through the entire data set and we have a pretty large data set. Um, I think, uh, let me see if I can, someone's asking to make the screen, text on my screen a little bit bigger. Hopefully that helps to make it a little bit more readable. Um, okay, so this is taking a little bit of time. Um, but I guess this now would be a good time if anyone has any um, questions, please drop it in the Q&A um, as this runs because this will take um, some time. Okay, that's done. All right. Um, so from there, uh, what we're going to do is again, do a train test split. So um, this is typically done using scikit-learn and they have this very nice and easy train test split that you can import. Um, and so the sort of the default size for the train test size is basically um, the test side is set to 0.25 and train set is basically one minus that. So basically 25% of your original data is put into test set and 75% is uh, put into your train. Um, so let me just run that and you can refer to this documentation right here, which basically goes and explains a little bit more on this train test. Um, from there, we're going to tr call our extra trees classifier, and this has a bit more um, parameters that we can specify. So first we look at the n estimators and the n jobs. Um, this extra trees classifier also has some documentation on the scikit-learn website, so I would recommend um, going in there and um, just reading up a bit if you would like. But basically what we're doing here is calling this classifier um, on our X train and our Y train. So basically we're, and what we're printing out from there is the accuracy of this classifier for both the X train and Y train and then our X test and Y test. So let's call that. And um, let me just see if there any more questions. Um, so there's a question about whether you want to remove the most frequent words like Mr. said would. You don't necessarily want to um, remove them. Um, typically, you just follow the words that are already included in that stop words library that NLTK provides to you. Um, you can choose to sort of add more if um, what you can do is actually go through and see, you know, is if a specific word like said is like so frequent that it is perhaps skewing your data or your results in some way you can go in manually and remove that if you would like but that's kind of just like a case-by-case -case basis in this case we're just going to remove only the words that are in um that stoppers li stoppers library that's given to us um and i'll answer the next question um but i'm just going to go back to our code just so we can um, complete this on time. So uh, we just ran our extra trees classifier. So on our train set, it's um, 100% and our test set is 84%. Um, and this is kind of the value that matters more because obviously when we're training, um, that's when our model is actually learning and um, understanding how to classify our text. But then our test set is actually where we're making the predictions and actually seeing how well is this classifier doing. Um, so now we're going to use another classifier and this is the um, ADA boost classifier. And so we're basically gonna go around to the same exact steps. We're gonna call it on the X train and Y train, and then switch over to our X test and Y test. So we're just gonna run through the same thing and see um, maybe this classifier is doing a better job. And so this is something that's like uh, very typically done in, um, in practice is that you don't choose just one classifier or just one model because you wanna sort of use 
um, different ones and see maybe one is doing better than the other. And then you can actually go in and understand why is a specific classifier doing better as compared to another one. Because all these different classifiers kind of have different, um, sort of a different general intuition behind them. And some of them will perhaps perform a lot better for specific kinds of data versus other kinds of data. As I mentioned, we have structured data, we have unstructured data, we have text data, we have images, audio, all sorts of kinds of data. So each of those might, um, you know, uh, every classifier might work better on one kind of data versus the other. Um, and let's see, I see a question. Does it matter which classifier to use first when trying multiple? No, I don't think it really matters. Um, something that uh, you can do is sort of choose like the most basic general purpose classifier and then sort of use more specific or more advanced ones from there. Um, and just to see, you know, maybe that's uh, improving your accuracy overall. Um, let's see. How do you select which models or do you always start ML by writing these models? Um, I mean, I, I think like, like I said, you can, um, you can kind of just start with the more general purpose ones and then get to more advanced ones from there. A lot of it depends on the specific domain you're looking at. Um, there are specific ones that you want to start out with if you're working with text data, but that's just for text data. There's all kinds of data that you um, can possibly work with. And every domain um, sort of has a set number of, you know, set collection of models that you um, expect to work well. And so you can kind of start out there and then, and then go from there. Um, and then I see a question about how does the output of train TFIDF look like? Um, I think if, if I have time, um, once I run through all these classifiers, I can return back to the TFIDF code and, and, um, and go through that. I think we should have time to do that. Um, let me just make sure this runs. And this is, um, I've actually run through pretty uh, large data sets and sometimes they take um, hours for these classifiers to, to run. So um, typically you kind of just let it run and then come back every few minutes just to check on it. Um, and that's one big advantage of using um, Google Colab because if you go over to the runtime and look at the runtime type, it actually allows you to have a GPU hardware accelerator, which is really nice for um, these really large data sets when you need like really uh, great computational power. Um, I don't think I'm using a GPU right now, but that's just kind of the default um, sort of accelerator that I've selected and I suggest you do the same. Um, it'll just help you to sort of run through um, your code a lot faster. Um, yeah, so I just got like a little you know note here that you know, you're connected to a GPU, but you're not utilizing it, but you know, I just continue to use one. Um, let's see. Yeah. So the sentiment score is given by text blob. Um, I haven't personally used them that much to know how reliable they are. There's definitely other ones out there in the industry. And I think just as like a general, um, suggestion is to, you know, use, uh, not just one sort of, um, model or not so just one sort of algorithm it's good to use different kinds because each of them have their um you know their pain points each of them have their benefits and advantages um and it also just makes um sort of the the result that you get at the end if you have a of a variety of models or different sort of um tools you're using it does make your entire argument a lot stronger if you're trying to um you know find out some new information about a data set. So that's just kind of a general suge suggestion. Um, but yeah, I can't say exactly how reliable it is because I haven't personally used it enough to, to really know. Um, okay, so that finished running. And as you can see, we were able to get um, an even higher accuracy on our test set as compared to the extra trees classifier. We were able to get 96%, um, up 12%. Um, and so next, I'm actually going to run through the random forest classifier. And here we're kind of going through the same thing. So we're going to call that on our X train and our Y train. Um, again, this is probably going to take some time. But basically, after these classifiers, we're going to basically run through the same steps, but for a few other models. So we're actually going to use our multinomial naive phase model. 
um, as well as the logistic regression model. Um, okay, so that finished. Um, so that's like a little bit, that's actually the worst one as compared to extra trees and, and the ADA boost. Um, so, you know, that kind of, um, that's just like a, you know, a, a, some nice information to know, as you can see, a random forest is performing the worst. And from there, if you would like to do more research, you can see, you know, how is this random forest classifier actually working? Why is it performing so much worse compared to the other two? And why is ADA, ADA boost doing the absolute best out of these three? Um, and so next we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to um, leverage the multinomial naive Bayes model. And this is directly from Scikit-learn. And basically go through the same step of basically just calling this. And as you can see on our test set, we had a 75%, just not that great at all. It's actually worse than our random forest classifier. Um, but let's see how logistic regression does. Um, and this is our last model that we're actually going to be um, running through. And then we're basically going to be going through some uh, model performance metrics, which are specifically accuracy, confusion matrix, um, and then just uh, that'll, that'll be the end of today's coding. Um, let's see here. I see another question. Um, is there a place that you go to see what the state-of-the-art state models are? And what are the known vector? benchmarks. Um, so I think the best way is that, you know, there's, there's research um, always going on and, um, you know, new papers being released, uh, you know, on a weekly basis or even more frequent than that. And um, I think the best way is just, um, you know, it is hard to sort of go through some of these research papers because a lot of them require a lot of prior knowledge or knowing exactly what um, that model is, is doing. But at a very high level, um, I would just say that that's kind of your your best way to see, you know, what is state of the art right now. Um, and you can do that by um, a lot of these research papers are um, completely open source. You can access them um, completely for free. You don't need to pay any money or have any sort of credentials to view them. So um, I myself am a graduate student, so I'm able to, I'm pretty, um, you know, integrated into the research community, at least for my university itself. And so from there, I'm able to see what are my colleagues, what are my peers, uh, what are all the different professors, what is their research. Um, and that just helps to sort of see what is the state of the art models for these different, um, you know, for all these different domains. Um, okay, so that the log logistic regression model completed. And as you can see, we actually got our best accuracy of 98%, which was even better than our AWS classifier. So in the end, with the logistic regression model did the best, and that's um, for our text classification on this fake news data set. Um, so the last section here is measuring model performance. And so while there's you know, other ways of measuring model performance, we have precision, recall, F1 score, F1 score ROC curve. I won't be going through um, these today, but what we're gonna focus on is a more simple metric, which is accuracy. And so accuracy is defined as the fraction of correct predictions um, or the you know the fraction of the correct predictions divided by the total number of data points. So it's a very nice and simple metric. And so the way we're going to calculate this is basically um, using the score method. And we're going to be calling that on the X test and Y test. And we're actually going to be uh, extracting the score from our logistic regression model. And so as you can see, when you print out the score, it's a 97.6% accuracy. Uh, which is a very, very good accuracy. Um, from there, we're going to um, predict and actually calculate the accuracy score. So that's from um, uh, importing from the scikit-learn metrics. We're basically going to first make our predictions of the statistic regression model on our X test. Um, and then from there, we're going to print out the accuracy score. And as you can see, this is the same um, value that was up here. It's our 97.65% accuracy. Um, another uh, really important, um, it's not necessarily like its own metric, but it's sort of a collection of metrics, which is our confusion matrix. And so this matrix is a table that's um, typically used to describe the performance of any sort of classification model. In our case, it's a text classifier. And this is uh, a model that's called on a set of test data for which the true values are known. Um, so in this section, I'm basically going to be showing two different Python packages. We have Seaborn and Matplotlib. 
Um, these are both very, um, they produce very nice and visually appealing images. Um, and this basically helps to sort of understand confusion matrices a little bit more. And so the confusion matrix below here, as you can see, it's not very, you know, uh, visually it's not very super informative or appealing in any way um, because if you call this as you can see it just prints out a two by two matrix but you don't really know like what are the labels here what does a row mean what does a column mean you don't really know what is happening here but first we can actually call our seaborn um, library and if we do that basically here we can actually get some labels we can try to sort of understand this a little bit more so what we have here um, is an, the actual label label of either zero or one, and then our predictor label of either zero or one. And this is basically the total number of values. So when the actual label was zero and we predicted it to be zero, it was 2,530 values. When the actual label was one and we predicted zero, it was, it was 45 and so on. Um, and so from there, we're able to basically extract this accuracy score of 97.6. Um, five or 97.65 percent um, and so from there um, as I said we basically can make the following conclusions so this 2530 is basically successfully predicting that many positive values and then 2537 is actually successfully predicting these negatives where the actual label was one and our predict label was also one and then we also have some false positives and false negatives so our false positive is actually our 77 value here, meaning our actual label was zero, but we predicted it to be one. So that's a false positive. Then we also have a false negative, where we, um, the actual label was one, but we predicted it to be zero. And so that's 45. Um, and from there, I'm basically going to um, have one more, uh, one more set of uh, values here that we're going to print out. And this basically will, uh, and just finish, let that finish running. Um, but in the meantime, I see a question about how to deal with sparse vectors and the sparse matrix to avoid computational issues. So um, as I mentioned that the, the sparse vectors is basically where you have um, this matrix of values where a lot of them are zeros. So, um, you know, some common ways is basically, you know, standardization, normalization, which includes all of this text pre-processing that I mentioned. So going further up when I was going through um, and identifying and removing the stop words, we expanded the contractions, we had stemming and lemmatization, we had um, noise cleaning. All of these help with sort of dealing with a sparse matrix, which can, you know, sort of um, complicate things and makes for some um, comp uh, computational issues. So that's one way to sort of work around that. Um, that is still running. But in the meantime, there's a question about um, what the train T of IDF looks like. So let me see where I can find that here. Um, so I'm actually going to, I'll, I'll revisit this once this completes running because I don't want anything to sort of um, break because sometimes when you try to run multiple cells in collab and if one is taking a very long time it kind of forces you to sort of refresh the entire thing and run everything over again and i i don't want that to happen um as we're wrapping things up but okay so this just finished so what um what this is outputting here basically is the, di the different test labels that we predicted so either zero or one and basically the id which is um you know 2599 and 2581 and that's basically counting out the number of labels that we predicted for the uh, negative and then um, how many values we predicted for the positive. Um, so that wraps us wraps up all the coding for today's session. Um, here are just a few more resources. Um, these were the um, some of the references that were directly used in um, some of the code that was used earlier today, as well as some additional reading that might help. Um, a lot of these are specific for detecting fake news with NLP in case you want to, um, you know, do any sort of projects on your own. Um, there's some blogs with towards data science and medium, which are very nice and easy to go through and they have all the code and the data set provided there. So you can kind of uh, run through that entire process on your own and try to get that entire workflow going. Um, so 
Let me just revisit the TF-IDF since someone had a question about that. So I'm just going to add another cell here and basically just print out the TF-IDF um, since someone was curious. So when you just print it out like that, it basically shows you the sparse matrix. You basically have um, this many stored elements and this is um, all of the, um, they're all of, uh, float values. So let me see if I can perhaps call it like that. Um, I think, I think I have to call it in a slightly different way since it's not exactly a, a data frame. Um, but I'm not recalling right now exactly how to do that. It's been a little while since I did that. But um, if you, uh, I'm not sure who exactly asked the, um, oh, let's see, someone put display. Okay, let me try that. Oops. Okay. Um, okay, that seems to be giving the same output. Um, but uh, whoever did um, ask that question, if you are part of our Slack uh, channel, please um, please join if um, if you can. The link to joining that is in the chat right now. And if you subscribe to the Help Me channel, then you can actually um, drop your question there, um, or you can uh, message message me directly, and I can look into this so I can um, answer your question. Um, Sorry, sorry to not be able to not be able to answer that right now. Um, but thank you, Hugo, for your suggestion. Um, I guess uh, I'll try to figure that out and, and get back to you. So that concludes everything for the coding section. I hope everyone was able to sort of understand the theoretical side, and we actually got to you know see all of it in action and run an entire um, text classification model. We saw different um, sorts of classifications. We tried it with. Um, the extra trees classifier, the ADA boost classifier, the random forest classifier, as well as the naive phase model and like logistic regression. Um, and um, of course, thank, thank you so much, Hugo. I'm glad that you um, have taken so much for the, from this, um, this series. And um, yeah, I hope you can um, look at, take a look at the previous, uh, previous sessions. We have two more to go. So on that note, um, let me just go back here. So here is some further um, some further homework. So just um, all of these um, are, are clickable links. So basically just some further text classification you can do using Spacey. Um, uh, you can do the same thing with Python and scikit-learn. Um, do something for just um, text analytics for beginners, again, using NLTK, which is a very powerful toolkit. Um, here's just a nice um, informative guide to text mining with Python as well as this comprehensive guide to understanding and, and implementing text classification in Python, just like we did today. Um, and to close, uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, and we hope to see you all next week. Um, next week, Joseph will be presenting on time series. Um, it'll be the same time, same day next week. Um, and again, if you are registered for today's webinar, you will also be registered for the rest of the series. And it's just the same link to join the webinar. And if you have any questions, please join us on Slack. Um, you can join through the, through the link that has been provided in the chat. Um, I think you can scroll up and access all of those. Um, you can also um, access all of our links. Um, the, that was dropped in the chat just a little bit earlier. Um, that includes um, all the previous recordings, as well as our social accounts, um, social accounts on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, again, we hope to see you all next week and have a great rest of the weekend. And um, I guess if anyone has any last minute questions, um, please drop that in the Q&A. Otherwise, I will um, conclude this just in a couple of minutes. Thank you, everyone.